How are you guys doing this morning? Is everybody well? Good, good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just happy to be here this morning. Happy to be back. Um, happy to be with you guys. Um, and just grateful for this opportunity. Um, I just want to give a simple testimony this morning. I'm just really thankful for uh, thankful for Morris this morning. I'm thankful for um, just the kind of uh, person that he is. I'm thankful for uh, his dedication to uh, what we do here every Sunday. I know we weren't, uh, we didn't gather together last Sunday, but this morning I was legit just excited um, to come together and to hear um, what he has prepared today. And I feel that way every every week. And so I'm just grateful for him. Um, I was feeling under the weather this week and grateful for just his support and his his care um, while I was sick and now, and now still recovering but on my way to just being back to normal. And so I'm just grateful for the person he is. I'm grateful for what he's doing for us. And I'm grateful for how the Lord is using him and his obedience to, to the word. So I'm just really thankful for that this morning. Um, if anybody else has anything they wanna be, they're thankful for or wanna share, now is the time. <laughs> well, I too, I'm thankful this morning for Morris. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to you, Leisha, for doing what you do. And to Kyra for doing what she do. And uh, I just thank God for the opportunity to be able to do this. All things is for a season. And I'm just thankful that for this season, you all are able to do this and stay committed to doing it because it's helping many people. And not just the ones that come on here, but the ones that see it on YouTube and other people that ask about it and I tell them where to go. So thank God for his word, being able to go out many different ways. And all and the three of you play a big part on that. And I thank you for it. I also would like to give God thanks this morning for another day. And I also like to say that this week has been a week of a lot of people giving a lot of attention to the word of God. And uh, I give God praises for that. And thank you for what he's doing, that more people are not just churching it, but they are believing in the kingdom of God, believing in his word, seeing results in their life, knowing that God's word is what it is. It's not just the Bible. And it's just a book that we carry under our arm, but it's the word. And it works wonders in our lives when we get to know his word. So I thank the Lord for providing that for us. And I see his word working mightily and many people who have decided to make a turnaround in their life and give God the glory and keep him first place in their life because their families are being affected. Their marriage is being affected. And that's what we want. That's what God wants. Amen. Amen. Morning again, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Thankful for for life, health, and strength as always, and and um, thankful for each and every one of you. There's been a I've had a lot going on in my life these days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, thank God for for keeping me in good spirits and in my right mind to to handle the the daily things that come up and. Um, you know, work has kept me very busy as well. We just just finished with this huge event, and then I even had to sing for the event, even though I was working the event as well. So, but um, yeah, all is all is well, and I just thank God for just like I said, just keeping me in the day to day. So, and Amen. I, all of you, I, I keep you all in, in my prayers, as I'm sure you pray for me. Amen. All right, well, we're going to get right into prayer this morning. Um, I'm just uh, also thankful just for the opportunity to pray with you guys, to pray corporately, to pray um, together. And so um, 
I'm just going to take a moment and just settle myself. Um, and I ask you to do your do the same as we focus in on this moment, on the next you know few moments that we spend together as we worship and praise, and also as we get into the Word of God today. Um, I just pray for no distractions and for our minds to kind of just um, slow down for a minute and our hearts uh, to settle so we can receive what the Spirit has for us today. Amen. So, Father, we come into your presence this morning with thanksgiving and praise. We thank you, Father, for being the one true God, to being our God, to yes. being King of kings and Lord of lords. We yes. thank you, Father, that we are not praying to an idol or to a statue made by hands, but we yes. are praying to a spirit, for God is spirit. And so we Amen. thank you, Father, that you are living <clears throat> and breathing and active and powerful, for you are majestic, you are wondrous, you're compassionate, you're strong, you're mighty. We There's so many words that we could use to express and describe who you are. And so we will do our best today to give you the sacrifice of our lips this morning. Yes. And so we're just grateful. We honor you today. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand and humble ourselves in your presence this morning. Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your goodness is better than life, that your faithfulness and your mercies are new every morning. We thank you, Father, for life, health, and strength, for breath in our lungs, for you are the one that gave us that breath. Yes. It, that the song says it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only father yes. and so we thank you father for that breath thank you, we thank you father for your foresight and your hindsight we thank you father that you are alpha and omega the beginning and the end and so even before this world was formed you had a plan and a purpose for our lives yes. we will never not praise you and show our gratitude and our gratefulness for your you, plans Jesus. for our lives that even before we were formed in our mother's womb that you knew us you knew our substance and yes. so i thank you father for the plans and the purposes of god prevailing today I thank you, Father, that even as we're praying that the darkness is being pushed back yes, and that your Jesus. light is shining before men today. I mm -hmm. thank you, Father, that wherever uh, your people are, wherever your children are, wherever those who may feel ostracized or far from you or hearts may be darkened or minds may be dull by the things and the emotions and the circumstances of this world, that your light shines and it dispels that darkness and pushes back and they see your face clearly today even as we pray today we send the word to the four corners of the earth today that your light will shine before men yes. your word says that with loving kindness you will draw all men unto you so i thank you father for that strong right hand to draw with that yes. loving kindness all men unto you we thank you father for your son jesus thank we you, thank jesus. you father for that for that for that manifestation of the wisdom and the power of God on earth. As he was born, the word says that he was called Emmanuel, God with us. So we thank you, Father, for his time on this earth, uh, for his example, for his leading and guiding, for his uh, words that we have written down in sacred pages. We thank you, Father, for Jesus being that ultimate sacrifice, redeeming and reconciling us back to you, Father. And now we thank you that he is now sitting at your right hand forever making intercession for us forever standing in the gap for us we thank you father that when you see when you see us you see him and so we're thankful father for that sacrifice we thank you father for the lord that has come down onto earth that we might yes. be saved and so we thank you for that title of son and daughter that we can cry out abba father for you are our source yes. you are everything that we need you are that beginning and the end there is nothing outside of you there is nothing above you and there is nothing below you so we thank you father for that you give us everything pertaining to life and god and godliness through your spirit and yes. so as jesus left this earth he said he would not leave us comfortless, but he would give us the Holy Spirit, that spirit living in earthen vessels that leads and guides us into all truth. And so we bless your name for that life-giving force on the inside of us now that yes. leads us and guide us for true sons and daughters worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we thank you, Father, for that revealing spirit today. 
Let there be a revealing today of your plan. Let there be a revealing today of your purpose. Let there be a revealing today of what you want us to know and understand. Yes. Our hearts are open, not hardened by unbelief or disappointment or distraction, yes. but they're focused. Our hearts are focused on you mm -hmm. that as the word is being sown today, it is sown into good ground and yes. that it will be grown and that it will manifest and bear fruit in its due season. I thank you, Father, that you're Jehovah Rapha, that you are the one that is the healer. I thank you, Father, that when your word says that you would do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, yes, that you allow yes. that power to be manifest and working through mm -hmm. us today. And so we thank you that you are the healer. That Thank healing you, is the children's bread, that before the foundations of the world, that you were our healer and by your stripes, we are healed. And so we send the word of healing to every body that is in, in a state of dis-ease, in a state of discomfort, yes. in a state of pain, in a state of dysregulation. Thank we you, send Lord. the word today that Thank all you. things come under the power of your Holy Spirit, that all body parts, all cells, all blood Thank vessels, you. all muscles, all Thank organs come under the subjection of your Holy Spirit and of your word of healing let there be a revelation of your healing specifically for each and every one who is dealing with sickness and disease, not only of the body, but of the mind. Yes, As there, is, there is sickness and disease that is ravaging the hearts and minds of men. Yes. There is anger. There is frustration. There is bitterness. Yes. There is sorrow. There is anger. So I thank you right now that for thank all you, these Jesus. illnesses, Father, let your word be a word of healing. Let your power be a healing power today. I thank you, Father, that there is a bomb in Gilead even today for the sin sick soul. So we thank you, Father, that there is a word of healing. Let your mm -hmm. divine power go forth this morning to bedrooms, to cars, to uh, shopping malls, to pharmacies, wherever people may be. Let there be yes. a divine intervention today. You, Let your Holy Spirit be powerful and seen above anything else. Let them arrive arrest people in their thoughts, let it arrest people in their actions, let it arrest people in their motives mm -hmm. and let your love shine above anything else. So I thank you, Father, for the testimony of healing. I thank you, Father, for the testimony of what you have done. I thank you, Father, for the testimony of your word piercing the natural and allowing the supernatural to be seen, felt, and heard. Mm -hmm. We yes. bless your name today for your Thank goodness you, is better than life. We uplift your name. We exalt yes. your name today exactly. high upon a hill for the thank world you, to see. I thank you, Father, that in, uh, in the upcoming days and weeks, there will be such revelation. Mm -hmm. There will be mm -hmm. such clarity. There will be such leading and guiding yes. by your spirit that men and women will start <clears throat> to turn back to you. They will start to dispel and, and discard the things of this world and turn to the spirit spirit for answers for direction yes. and for clarity Jesus. i thank you father that when you say um that the true sons and daughters are led by the spirit and not by the flesh i thank you father that we move into the position thank that you, we Jesus. are totally led by your spirit so let the voice of the spirit reign supreme let it be louder than any other voice let all the other voice be silenced under the power of the Holy Ghost today. Yes. So I thank you right Jesus. now for an obedience to your voice yes. and obedience you, to your word. Let men and women have visions and dreams. Let your voice be loud in their night seasons. Let them wake up with revelation mm -hmm. and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Let the word open up before them with clarity and understanding. Your word says that if anybody asks for wisdom, that you will give it freely but mm -hmm. we will not be double-minded, unstable in all our ways. Let us believe. Let us trust you, God. Yes. And so we thank you, Father, for the joy and peace in believing who you are. We thank yes. you, Father, for the word that is given, when it be brought to us today. Let it pierce our understanding. Mm -hmm. Let it push us forward into understanding who you are, your mind and your heart towards us and to, the, to those around us. Yes. I thank you, Father, for a special blessing being upon all those under the sound of my voice who have dedicated their time, their effort, and their and their love and their their dedication to what we do here every Sunday. I thank yes. you, Father, for a special blessing 
a special endowment upon those here. And so we love you today. Thank you, Jesus. Our hearts are full of gratitude yes. and praise and thanksgiving today. For you are beautiful in all your ways. And there is none like you. Yes. And so we bless your name today. We say hallelujah. We say glory. We say you are our majesty. You are the line of Judah and the land that was slain. And so we love you and we thank you for all these things. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 I guess you guys are waiting on me. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I have my headphones on. I didn't know when she uh when she was done. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy you Sunday to you. Huh? I was just making sure you could hear me. Yep. All right. Well, happy Sunday to you. Excited to get into our lesson today. Mm -hmm. Put my phone on silent. It's been a, uh, an eventful weekend. That's mm -hmm. the best part of the weekend. All right. I was uh, I was helping a friend of mine um, yesterday navigate through some uh, some challenging situations, <clears throat> and uh, he's a pastor, and just helping him navigate through some challenging situations. And as we were going through it, I was um, I stopped and I, I prayed on it for a second. Just ask God, like, what is this about? You know, what is your will in this situation? Or what is the enemy after um, as to why these challenges are arising? And as I'm praying that prayer, um, I, I hear the, the pastor say, um, this, this is costing me too much, referencing the trials and circumstances. And it clicked to me right then and there in a moment that that's what the enemy was after. Mm. What, what was after the commitment, was after the, the obedience to, to our calling. Mm -hmm. And the father said, I don't care what it, if it costs you everything, mm -hmm. that you go forth and you do it. If it costs you everything, mm -hmm. Jesus told us, if the world hates us, remember I had hated him first. Amen. And I've been trying to keep that perspective that, that, you know, that applied to that situation yesterday, but it applied to my life even more importantly, because um, there's some times where you start to wonder if, if, if you're on the right track and, and am I doing what he told me to do? Um, and then you look at some of the things that you sacrificed to be on the track. And you showed me that you can't have this life without sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. You can't have the life of Christ without sacrifice. For Christ sacrificed everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. He laid his life down for us. And so it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a consistent reminder that with this commitment comes great sacrifice. Amen. The heavier the call, the more significant the call, there's going to be an equal weight of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot to bear. And so it's, it's, it's about your decision to, um, to decide if you're willing to make that commitment and that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
I've decided that I'm going to do this thing no matter the cost at this point, no matter the cost. If, if, if it costs me everything, and sometimes it feels like it's doing just that, like it's costing you everything, I'm going to go forward because he did. He paid the cost for us. He made the sacrifice for us. And if we're going to call ourselves Christians and say we're Christ-like, then we got to enjoy the sacrifice as much as the glory. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Today I titled this, this is not my sermon. <laughs> the wrong term to pull up. I titled today, um, Kingdom Law. Kingdom Law. And I wanted to talk about the law of God from a kingdom perspective. We know that this Bible is about a king and his kingdom and kingdom expansion. Kingdom expansion. And he's expanding his kingdom through his family, through his children. And so it's interesting that God chose to colonize and expand his kingdom uh, through blessing, by blessing his children with a plan of their own and saying, this is going to be the, the, the earth and this is where my dominion and, and, and my kingdom shall be expanded to. We know God lives in the heavens of heavens, but he says the earth he gave to the children of men. And so he gave the earth to the children to expand his kingdom, his, his, his influence, his wills, his desires mm -hmm. on the earth, in the earth. Amen. And so along with the kingdom of God comes the law of God. Mm -hmm. This is where, where, where freedom without law is anarchy. You can't have a kingdom without having law. God is the God of order. He's a God of order. He's not the God of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. So anywhere that God sends his word, he sends his law. It's why in the garden, in the book of Genesis, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil was a tree of law. That tree of knowledge was a tree of law was knowledge of laws. And so I want to talk about kingdom law from the perspective that you would look at law in any other country. You know, as you go through countries in the world, the law system changes. The laws applies to the country. The laws applies to the kingdoms. We have kingdoms that still exist today. And their law structure and governance looks much different than other laws and governance. It's not a democracy in a kingdom. That's one of the most significant differences. It's not a democracy. It's not the law of the people, what the people wish, what the people want. And in and, and, and the kingdom, the king sets the order in the law. Mm -hmm. And if you do not wish to be associated with that kingdom law, then you're going to have to find a new country because you do not get to vote a king in. The king is not voted in. It's not based on popularity. It's not based on votes. It's based on um, the hierarchy, seniority. It's based on inheritance. Mm -hmm. And when you look at inheritance, it's something that they inherit, it's something that they're given, something that they're blessed with. And ultimately, the, the, there's no title that makes the king. The king makes all titles, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So when, when, when a king um, comes into an environment, that environment becomes royal. When a king uh, puts on his slippers at night, they bring him his royal slippers. Now, these slippers might not be nothing more than some $20 Nike sandals, but in the moment that he places them on his feet, those are called royal slippers. <laughs> his maids and his servants go out and they, they, they bring the royal slippers. When he gets ready to eat his dinner, he gets his spoon and his fork and his knife. And that's, that's the royal cutlery. Why? It, it, it belongs to the king. <laughs> when the king goes home and, and gets ready for bed or, or, or is hanging out at his house, that's called the royal palace. 
Yes. It's, it, it, it just is home. It, it might be a mansion. It might be a small house. It doesn't matter the size. If the king resides there, it's the royal palace. Amen. So every environment the king walks into, that environment takes on his nature, his essence. So God says, I make you kings and priests. Mm -hmm. So now when you go into the earth, he said, you take the royalty that's on the inside of you and you carry that into the earth, infecting it, colonizing it with the essence of royalty. Amen. So that's the perspective that we want to look at this message from today as we talk through kingdom law. I'm going to start us out in, uh, in Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. Um, actually, let's start at the 24th verse. Let's start at the 24th verse. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or God and mammon. Same difference. He starts off and he says, you can't serve two masters. Mm -hmm. We know the scripture says you are not your own. So if he tells you here, you can't serve two masters, then simultaneously he's telling you, you have to pick a master. Amen. You are either going to be slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. There's no intermediary. There is no gray area. There is no alternative option. You have two choices, slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. In either direction, you are a slave. And I don't mean slave in a negative sense. I don't mean in a negative sense. To be slave to somebody means they have rule over you. They have dominion over you. I'm telling you, being a slave to Christ is the greatest inheritance anybody can ever have. There is no greater reward. It's the, it's the crown of all creation to be a slave to Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's not a negative thing. We, we're, 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 we're excited to be slaves to Christ. Slavery is not an option. You simply get to choose your master. So he says, then to be slaves to Christ. So no one can serve two masters. You'll serve him or you'll serve mammon, which is money. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or your body, what you'll wear. Is life not more than food and the body not more than clothes? Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that stuff, man. What are you worrying about that stuff for? What are you going to eat? And what am I going to wear? And, and he says, don't worry about that stuff. I was looking at this study recently of the amount of hours that people spend thinking about food on a daily basis. It was unimaginable. It was unimaginable. I said, that can't be right. Do people really think about food that much? And, 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 and Jesus knew this, which is why he said, hey, take your mind off of food. Why are you concerned with that? So you eat, and then you spend time thinking about the next meal while you're eating this meal. And when you get to that meal, you're already planning what you have for the next meal. But people become so frustrated. And, and, and every single moment of the day, you're thinking about the next meal. He says, stop thinking about that stuff. Hmm. Is life not more than food and clothes and what you're going to put on? The, 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 they, they were out preaching the gospel with Jesus, and Jesus had gave his message. And then all the people were gathered, and they didn't have any food to feed them. And people had come a long ways, and it's a long way back. And they were worried about what are we going to eat. And so the disciples brought the issues and the concerns and the worry to Jesus and said, "Hey, we we don't have any food to give these people." And Jesus couldn't believe you. You worried about lunch? <laughs> lunch? He said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't worry about lunch. You, you're, you don't think that we're going to be provided lunch? <laughs> so God, Jesus said, give me what you have, because all he needs is a seed. That's all he needs. That's all he ever needs. All he ever needs is a seed. If, if, if he has a seed, 
He has enough to provide for anything pertaining to life and godliness. But he said, give me the little that you have. Why? Because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. So I got two fish and five loaves. That's more than enough. Bring it here. And then he provided for the 5,000. He provided for the masses. He said, don't worry and concern yourself with lunch. God is greater than your concerns about lunch. He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? He's making a very straightforward point. If I provide for the birds, will I not feed my children? The birds don't have a physical job. They don't go to work and get paid and then provide for themselves. So they have a dependency on the king. He said, look at them. Can't you see God in nature? Can't you see that I take care of that which belongs to me? If I do it for them, you think I won't do it for the children? Amen. That's like a parent, that's like a parent in the household feeding their dog daily. Every day, you make sure the dog pays. You take him for a walk. You take him outside and use the bathroom. You feed the dog. You feed the dog. You feed the dog. And then when it comes time for the kids to eat, how could you be concerned that I won't feed my own children when you see me feed the dog? Mm. God said, I, aren't you more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? So he gives them the examples of the flowers of the field and how they grow and how they spin. And again, he's using nature to draw a clear-cut correlation to that everything in nature depends on him to include you. Yes. To include you. Yeah. He said, watch how they depend on me. The grass don't take care of itself. The mm. flowers don't take care of itself. The animals don't. None of these things. I uphold all things by the word of my power. Amen. Mm -hmm. If I take care of them, please have the confidence that I'll take care of you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It says, O ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. O ye of little faith. The word, O ye of little faith, um, is the word in the Greek, only pistos. Only pistos. It's a grammatical construct. Um, it's two words. It's ogly and it's pistis. Um, the word ogly means lacking. The word pistis means faith. Together, it means you don't have faith. You, he uses this word as a, a, a slight rebuke for those who aren't operating in faith. Uh, oh, ye of little faith. It says, so do not worry what you shall eat, and what you shall drink, or what you shall wear. For the pagans run after all these things. He said the pagans chase these things. Mm -hmm. This is what they run after. And I love that he put that description in there, that they run after these things. He said, and your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Amen. Amen. And then all these things shall be given to you. All these things shall be added unto you. The pagans run after these things. He said, but when you seek first the kingdom and righteousness, you don't have to run after them. That's not the way. He said, yes. they're supposed to be given. They're supposed to be added unto you. Yes. This is why the scripture starts off by saying, you'll either serve God or you'll serve mammon. If you serve mammon, then you'll chase the bag, as they say in today's uh, uh, slain. They chase the bag. When you serve mammon, you have to run after these things. He said, but when you seek first the kingdom, seek first the kingdom, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, he said, these things come running after you. Mm -hmm. They'll be given to you. They'll be added okay. unto you. Amen. Listen, it, it brings the king a great level of displeasure to see his children running after things that he freely gives. Faith is the substance of things. Faith is the substance of things. He said, don't run after these things. Faith is the substance of these things. Grace makes it available. Faith appropriates these things. Righteousness is a faith. Seek first the kingdom and righteousness. Righteousness is a faith. Faith is the substance of these things. He said, leave the things alone. Don't run after them. That's your inheritance. You don't chase money. 
Money is part of the inheritance. Prosperity is part of the inheritance. Healing is part of the inheritance. Why are you chasing after the things that are freely given? <laughs> to, 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 to chase after them is to work for them. He said, no, you don't work for these things. You don't work for these things. He said, if you work for them to earn them, then they don't come through grace. Hence, the scripture says, it is of faith. Why is it of faith? That it might be by grace. I want you to receive it by faith because that's the way I distribute it to you through grace. It's dimensionally transferred through faith, but it's an act of grace. Why is it an act of grace? Because you don't work for it. You don't work for it. He said, don't run after these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then it will be automatically given unto you. Amen. So he said, make not the priority the thing, but make the priority first. First means priority. There's no ambiguity in that statement. When he says first, that means number one priority. It means it takes precedence over everything else. It should, it should be, kingdom is the country, it's the place, it's the location, it's, it's, it's the power, and righteousness is, is the position. So he said, seek first the country. Mm -hmm. Seek the territory. Seek, seek the king's dominion. Kingdom, king dominion. That's what I want you to seek first, and his righteousness, his righteousness. So seek the country and to be in right standing with the country as a citizen. And to be in right standing with the country as a citizen. He said, and then all things will be added unto you. Now notice he said his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Who is his righteousness? Who is his? His is Christ. His is Christ. You do not have any righteousness. No, you don't. Adam destroyed that. Oh, he gave it up. You were made in righteousness. Adam said, I'm giving it up, and I'm claiming my independence. God said, that's okay. I'm going to send a man named Jesus, and you can live by the faith of the Son of God, and you can be clothed in his righteousness. Mm-hmm. Clothed in his righteousness. This is expressly why, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is expressly why Jesus made sure he kept the entirety of the law. Every last bit of it. All 613 commandments, he kept them perfectly. Why? Mm -hmm. Because now by the law, he can claim righteousness. And guess what? Through faith in Jesus, you are now clothed in righteousness. When you believe you become one spirit with Christ, that means you're putting on his righteousness. Amen. That's the righteousness of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and be clothed in his righteousness. When you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you are in right standing with God. You are a citizen that's upholding the law and standards of God. Mm -hmm. And your behavior, your conduct will come into alignment. Yes, yes. it will, because it, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're clothed with Christ, and now he controls your decisions, actions, habits. He conforms your character to his character. Look, listen to the definition of the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness. It's the earnest expectation of righteousness. It means to be fully conformed to the will of God. It's man's conformity to Christ. That's the hope of righteousness. What happens then? Christ in you becomes the hope of glory. Christ lives inside you. As he is, guess what? So are you in this place, in this earth, in this time. That's right. You take on his nature, his essence. And you're made in right standing with the king. And, 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 and the inheritance lies in righteousness. The inheritance lies in righteousness. That's why righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom. It allows entrance into the kingdom. It gives access. It's access granted into the kingdom of God. 
So righteousness is a faith. Psalms 84.11, Psalms 84.11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He said, those who walk righteously, oh, I'm not holding no good thing from them. I'm not holding no good thing from those who walk righteously. No good thing. Faith is the substance of things. That's why faith is the currency to appropriate what grace has made available. He said, if you walk uprightly, that's a promise. It's a promise. God makes mm -hmm. good on his promises. Amen. If you walk uprightly, I won't withhold anything from you. Mm -hmm. I'll just freely give it to you. Uh, Philippians 3.17. Philippians 3.17. I'm going to read this from the, uh, the Amplified Translation. He says, brothers and sisters, together follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. It says, follow my example. Mm -hmm. We've laid forth an example that just shall live by faith. We're going to show you what it means to live by faith. I want you to follow this example and observe those who live by this pattern we gave you. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, who live as enemies to the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his ways of salvation, whose faith is destruction, whose God is in their belly, mm -hmm. their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their minds on earthly and temporal things. He said, that's not the pattern of the kingdom. These people are focused on earthly things, things that are temporal, things that are vain. He said their God is in their belly. What does he mean by that? He means that when you're conformed to the things of this world, you build an appetite for, for, for simple earthly worldly things. And he said they become your God. And so now your God relies in your, resides in your belly. It goes on to say, but we are different. There's a differentiation between the system of the world and the kingdom of God. We are different. Tell them why you're different. Because our citizenship is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we eagerly await the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say our citizenship will be in heaven. He didn't say our citizenship is going to be in heaven. He didn't say in the hereafter we'll be citizens of heaven. He said right now, when you Amen. become the righteousness of Christ, your citizenship Amen. is in heaven. When you go to, me and Alicia went to Toronto, Canada recently. When we went there, we didn't lose our American citizenship. You didn't lose your citizenship. I don't care if you're on planet Earth. You're citizens of heaven. You're citizens of the kingdom. It doesn't matter where you, you got to remember, you are sent to the Earth. You're sent to the Earth. But your citizenship resides in heaven. So everywhere you go, you're still a citizen of heaven. I can leave right now and then go to China and anything that happens to me in China, they're still going to have to understand that I am an American citizen. But we are different because we're citizens of heaven. Religion has members. Countries have citizenship. Churches have members. Kingdoms have citizenship. We have to learn how to shift our mindset from, from membership to <laughs> citizenship. It, 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 the only way to do that is through the word of God. But what we're really trying to do is get our minds out of a state of, of rituals and get into rights. Mm -hmm. And get into rights. That's why it's titled kingdom law, because kingdoms have laws. It's a country that has laws. 
Religion has taught us rituals, things to do consistently and practices. And, and I don't say that to make it sound like practices are bad. There are good practices, but you have to look at them in context of law. There's laws associated with things. If I want, I got this tablet in my hand, if I want this tablet to have power, well, the law says I got to plug it in. <laughs> It's that simple. It's, it's, it's the laws of power. You, you got to have a cord and you got to be plugged into something that's given power and then it charges the device. And that's, that's the law to charge the device. We have to understand laws. Members have no power. Citizens do. Citizens have power through rights. You hear people talk to, to lawyers and to judges and to police officers and it's all about their rights. It's about what my rights are. And when you get pulled over, they, they read you your rights when they try to arrest you. It's all about, it's all about rights. So kingdom is government power, but righteousness is government position. Kingdom is government power, righteousness is government position. Kingdom is rulership, but righteousness is relationship. The king dominion is about his rulership. He said, but righteousness is going to be about relationship. Kingdom is about dominion. Righteousness is about right standing. Kingdom is control. Righteousness is disposition. His kingdom is looking to control, to dominate an environment. So kingdom is horizontal because let me tell you why I say horizontal, because he sent you to the earth to let your kingdom come, let your kingdom come so that his will can be done on earth. So it's horizontal. The kingdom is within. The kingdom is within. And now I'm distributing the kingdom into the earth. I'm allowing his kingdom to come to the earth through me. So that's horizontal. But righteousness is vertical. It's relationship. I told you your citizenship is in heaven. Your citizenship is with heaven. So your relationship to your citizenship in heaven, that's vertical position. So kingdom is horizontal, but righteousness is vertical. Kingdom is king. Kingdom is king, but righteousness is priest. But righteousness is priest. Your crown gives you your dominion. But your turban gives you the righteous relationship. It gives you relationship. That's why you say you are both kings and priests. Mm -hmm. Kingdom is power. Kingdom is power. That's so important to know. Kingdom is power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, logos, but it's in the demonstration of power, dunamis. Yep. Dynamis is God's miracle working power. I hold all things by the word of my power. Kingdom is not in word. What does that even mean, Morris? What does that mean it's not in word? Word is, logo is potential. It's potential energy. It has power in it. It has power in it. So it's potential. But dynamis is power that's going forth. It's power, rainless is power being poured forth. So it's not no longer potential, but it's kinetic energy. Potential means it's full of power, but it's sitting idle. Kinetic means it's power, but it's in motion. So he said, the kingdom is not in logos. It's not in potential, but it's in the pouring forth of power. He said, it's in power and demonstration. That's kingdom being enforced in the earth through laws the pouring forth of power. So righteousness and law must coexist. It's impossible to have righteousness without law. So I said freedom without law will always be anarchy. A law-abiding citizen is simply a citizen that is in good standing with the government. Emotions do not change law. Amen. The reason why emotions don't change law is because God doesn't change. Mm -hmm. He's the God of law and order. Mm -hmm. God does not change. He said the words, once they have gone out of my lips, 
Yes. They can't be changed. They're rough. They, they cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. He said, I will not alter the things that have gone out of my lips. He won't mm -hmm. alter them. When uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, this is actually a really good example of no matter how emotional one becomes, that's not going to move the law. Hebrews 12, 16, it says, lest there be any fornication of profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. We know the story of Esau and his brother and how he sold his birthright. It says, for you know that afterwards, after he sold his birthright for some food, he wanted to inherit the blessing, but he was rejected. Now listen to this. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This man is destroyed. You sold your birthright for some food? That's, that's, that's unthinkable. And then when he comes to the knowledge of what he did, it says he sought repentance, a shift in direction. He wanted to reverse what he had done. He yes. sought repentance with many tears. He's crying and he's crying and he's crying and he's crying. But it makes no difference. It makes no difference. The law stands. You sold the birthright. And it stands. You sold it. He said he sought repentance with many tears. And we do this often. We do this often. God is not always moved by your emotions and your tears and your limpy prayers and, and, and your sorrowfulness. And, and he said, my son, my daughter, there are laws to this thing. Amen. Amen. There's rules to this. I, I, I can't break the rules for you. I'm sorry. I can't break the rules. He allowed his own son to die to avoid breaking the rules. Why couldn't God just snap his finger and turn back what Adam had done? Because mm -hmm. there's rules. Mm -hmm. There's laws. God is bound by his own laws. They don't like that statement. They don't like that statement. He's God. Nothing, nothing is above him. Nothing is greater than him. Oh, really? I exalt my word above my name. Don't tell me. He's bound by his own laws. Mm -hmm. That's his decision, though. He, he decided to do that. Yes. He said, when I speak something, it becomes governance to me and everything else around me. Mm -hmm. It's governance. So if I said it, now I'm bound to do it. Why? Because I can't lie. Yeah. God cannot lie. He don't have an enemy. It's not in his character. So if I say it, I'm bound by it. And I think this is sometimes where it talks about and, and, and it repented the Lord. And it repented the Lord. And it repented the Lord. Why does it repent the Lord? Because his law, his words have consequences. And even if that word that goes out of his mouth, if it causes destruction, which is sometimes due, he still has to uphold it because it's his word. Mm -hmm. He said the wages of sin is death. Yes, death brings destruction to mankind. He said, I'm sorry, I got to uphold it. It's my word. I can't take it back. Thank God that I that I, I, I foreseen this happening and I created a sacrifice in, in, in advance, but I still got to uphold my word. Mm -hmm. I got to keep my word, you know. It's, 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 it's nothing more. If I break my word one time, two things happen. Everything falls apart because everything is held together by his word. Complete, utter dissolution, destruction, disaster, chaos, if he breaks one word. So I said, I can't break my word. Second things that happen, if he breaks his word once, if he goes back on his word once, you can never trust his word again. Yeah. You can never, you can't have complete confidence. You can have 99.9% .9 confidence, but you always remember, remember that one time he went back, this might be, so you can't have absolute confidence 
<laughs> and there's a potential that he might go back and he said, I'll never break my word. Mm -hmm. He saw it with many tears and repentance, but he found it not. You can cancel your rights when you violate law. The violation of law always cancels out rights. Life is not hard. Obedience is hard. When you understand the law and you understand obedience, life becomes easy. You have the knowledge of the law. You can walk in freedom. You know, it, 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 was, it was challenging when you first learned how to operate a vehicle because you had to learn so many things. You got to learn the instruction of the vehicle, when to push the gas and how far to push the gas and, and how to use one foot to switch back to the brake and when do I put my turn signal on and, 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 and am I too close to this car? And, and which lane do I turn in? And when I come to the yield, do I, do I got to wait for him? And, and when it's a red light, you know, can I go through the yellow? You got to learn all the laws associated with driving. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little scary and you're a little nervous and it takes practice. Yes. But man, I tell you, if you've been driving for a year, you don't even think about the laws. You don't think about it. Why? Because it's been embodied. Yes. You don't think about what you're doing when you're turning. It's automatic. Your eyes see the road and how far you got to go, and you automatically, you, you're not even conscious of it anymore. You've driven so many places unconsciously. You're not thinking about it. You're just doing it. <laughs> you don't think about switching your foot from the gas to the brake. That's natural. The laws are embodied. That's a significant difference. Before you had to think of every little rule, every little law, is my hands in the right position? Is my foot switching at the right time? You're paying attention to every single little law until they become embodied. Until they become embodied. What happens when they're embodied? You now have the liberty of the law. The spirit of the law is in you. So what happens then? You unconsciously abide by the law. Mm -hmm. Unconsciously. Not line upon line, precept upon precept. It's built into you. That's how God made creation. He built the laws of a thing in the thing. Amen. He built the law. There's not one creation. I'm talking about not one that God spoke into existence where the laws didn't come in the thing. It always comes in. That, that, it's no different than how we do things today. When we build products as manufacturers, you place the laws of the operation of a thing in the thing. Amen. God is a, a, a creator, an inventor, a manufacturer. He did the exact same thing. So laws are necessary in creation. We all must obey laws because learning the laws have become essential to life. Absence of law always brings the beginning of destruction. The absence of law brings the beginning of destruction. Think about a mango seed for a second. When you have a mango seed, which has a, a mango tree on the inside of the seed, you place the seed into a, a, a glass of, of a cup of coffee. I take the mango seed and I put the mango seed in my cup of coffee. The tree is still inside the seed. Mm -hmm. That didn't change. The tree, the mango tree still resides inside the seed. But it can't become what it's designed to be because the seed were, was not created to live and grow in coffee. Mm -hmm. I, I need you to understand this concept because it don't change the essence of the seed. It's just not obeying the laws of growth. There's laws of growth. The laws of growth, there's laws of germination. It says that that seed cannot germinate in coffee. Why? Well, the law says seeds need soil in order to grow. In order to germinate, they need water, not coffee. 
So I place it in coffee and I can have all the expectation I want. That mango seed is going to become a mango tree. Father, in the name of Jesus, I said, let the seed grow. I said, let the seed turn into the mango trees. I can smell the mangoes today. I don't care how many words of spiritual righteousness that come out of my mouth. That seed ain't turning into no mango tree. Why? There's laws. There's laws. You know, you pray about so many things that have laws associated with them. He says, son, just you, you got to understand my law. You, gotta, you can pray, but you got to understand the law. There's laws associated with it. Father, help me. Father, bless me. There's laws associated with blessings. Father, heal me. There's laws associated with healing. These are mm -hmm. spiritual laws. What you're really doing is you're asking him, give me mercy. And what do you mean by that, Morris? You're saying, Father, bypass the law and give it to me through mercy. He said, but, but there's a law of faith. There's a law of faith. Faith appropriates promise. That's the law. Yeah, but I don't got none of that. I find it so hard to stand on your word. I find it so hard to, to, to obtain that level of confidence. Faith comes by hearing. I find it so hard to meditate on your word, to hear your voice. And since I won't obey the laws of faith, can you please just give it to me through mercy? You, 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 so you're just going to let me die? You're going to let me go without my needs met? You said you would supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So you're holding him accountable and simultaneously neglecting the law of faith. What happened to the scripture that says everything comes by faith? Everything. Everything comes by faith. He said, this is a new covenant called grace, where it's appropriated through faith. So you have to get it through faith. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. Hmm. The most important knowledge on earth is the knowledge of law. The reason why you read the Bible is not so much for daily devotion, but you read it to understand the law of God. Yes. Devotions don't protect you from failure. Obedience of the law protects you from failure. Every time the children of Israel uh, would disobey God's law, they went into captivity. And God said that that was going to happen in, in, in advance. He said, every time they abandoned my law, they were going to see captivity. And so it was happening. They would abandon God's law, his instruction, and they would end up in captivity. And then the nation would be destroyed, the children of Israel. Then God would bring them back. He would always bring them back. And every time he brought them back, the first thing he would do is tell them, crack open that scroll and pay attention. Give attention to my word. Pay attention to my law, his instructions. So they would open up the scroll and they would get back into the right alignment with the law. And then the nation would be rebuilt. But notice that it's always rebuilt on law. You can't start a nation without law. Law is governance of a nation. A nation must be founded on law because law brings righteousness to those citizens. When things go wrong with any product, obviously the first thing you do is go look in the manual because you're looking to learn the law. So when things go wrong with you, the first thing you should do is go look at the law concerning your circumstance. What did God say in the manual concerning the circumstance? I'm his product. Mm -hmm. We turn to the world for so much information. We turn to the therapist. We turn to the psychiatrist. We turn to the doctor. We turn to the friends. We turn to the family. And, and I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm just saying that there's a standard and there's an instruction that's in the manual about the product. Amen. And then he tells you, he said, listen, seek first. Seek first. You go through all these things and then you come back to God as the last resort and say, God, I just don't get it. He says, son, I told you to seek first. 
I told yeah. you to seek first. Seek first what, God? The kingdom. Mm -hmm. The king's dominion and, 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 and righteousness. And then all those things you keep worrying about and being concerned about, I'll just give those to you. They'll be added to your life. Why? Because that's the inheritance of the believer in the kingdom. Amen. Righteousness. Age doesn't automatically bring wisdom. Understanding of law brings wisdom. Mm -hmm. I, I know people who've been working in companies um, throughout my career. I see these guys who've been working in companies and they've been in the company, the same company for 25, 30, 40 years. You know, these are long tenured individuals and nothing makes these people mad. I find it hilarious actually. Nothing makes these people matter than when a college kid that's half their age comes out of college, they got their master's degree, they might have their doctorate, and then the executive team makes that kid your boss. Oh, that makes them so mad. They be so <laughs> upset. They can't believe I've been in this company for 35 years. I've been here longer than you've been alive. <laughs> and they, 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 the executive team, don't, they don't care. Why? This young man understands the laws. Mm -hmm. He understands the principles. He has the knowledge of government concerning the product or service that we're trying to get out to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Does it, it, it doesn't matter that you're older. He understands the law. So they put him over you. That's what he went to college for, to get educated concerning laws. Yeah. Understanding marketing, those are laws. Understanding sales, those are laws. Understanding strategies, tactics, cultural transformation, change management, those are laws. These are principles, precepts, ideas. And so you learn them and you become invited with them and they find you extremely valuable. Why? Because you have the knowledge to control circumstances. That's what that, that knowledge of law gives you. It gives you knowledge to control circumstances. Why? Because you understand the laws and the rights that govern systems. In the Air Force, there's here's another funny example. In the Air Force, you have all these rankings. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but the highest ranking um, for a, there's two different sides. There's commission officers, and there's non-commissioned officers. So when you're active duty military um, and you're a non-commissioned officer, there's all these ranks. It's E1 through E9, E9 being the highest. So the lowest when you first joined the military, and this is the Air Force at least, you start off as an airman, airman first class. E2, you move on to airman. E3, you move on to senior airman, and you have three stripes. And then after senior airman, you get promoted to staff sergeant. Every time you get promoted, you get an additional stripe. And that's what's impressive to people because your, your stripe represents your rank. Your rank represents your level of power and authority. E5, so you got airman, first class, airman, senior airman, staff sergeant, and then it goes to technical sergeant. And then after technical sergeant, because that the stripes are going down, you get this huge patch with the stripe on top that and they call you a master sergeant. And now you really hold some authority. And now they allow you to command flights of troops. And sometimes they give you your own department. And that's a big deal to be a master sergeant. And then if you go further than that, you become a senior master sergeant. They put two stripes up top. And that's a lot of seniority. There's not a lot of senior master sergeants. It takes a lot of time to get those promotions. And when you read senior master sergeant, it's not just time for promotion. They're only allowed to have a certain number in the Air Force at all. So it's not even just 10 years. Sometimes you can meet the qualifications, but there's just not a spot available for you to move into that rank. And then after senior master sergeant, all the way at the top is chief master sergeant. They put three stripes up here. So now your whole sleeve is just full of stripes. There's mm -hmm. no room left. And when you see the chief coming, hey, you carry some honor when you were chief. You got all your badges on your shirt. You see the chief coming, hey, chief, how you doing? Everybody want to speak to the chief. It's a pleasure to shake the hand of the chief. 
You don't even become a chief until you spend at least 24 years in the military. It takes a long time to be chief master sergeant. Mm -hmm. Only, what is it? 1.25% of the military reach chief master sergeant. Only 1% ever make the chief master sergeant. But then you have a few that actually make it. Now watch this. A chief master sergeant in the Air Force. He's been in the Air Force 25 years. He has the respect of everybody on the Air Force base. But then there's another side of the fence called commission officers. Commission officers. Their ranks are different. This is your first lieutenant, second lieutenant, captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonels, generals. That side of the fence are meant to command. A first year butter bar, I hate that term, butter bar lieutenant outranks a chief master sergeant. <laughs> 23 years of service, 25 years of service, arm full of rankings. And this guy comes in out of college he got his bachelor's degree. He ain't nothing but 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And the chief master sergeant better snap to attention and salute that lieutenant every single time he sees him. Why? He outranks him. Doesn't matter how many years of service, no matter how many strikes on your sleeve, by law, he outranks him. So the chief reports to the lieutenant. Now, they have mutual respect with one another, but it doesn't break the law and the command given. And they give it to the lieutenant. They give him that order. They give him that authority because of the laws and the knowledge that he went and obtained to hold that position. I even seen one time, um, you know, chiefs, a lot of chiefs hold this swagger about them. And, you know, they've been in the position so long and they get so much respect that some of them don't respect these young lieutenants that just came out of college. And so sometimes it can be a little confrontational. So one time I'm watching, these two guys are standing in front of the chow hall and there's a chief master sergeant down there and he's talking to another guy and, and the lieutenant, young boy, he can't be no more than 24, 25 year old, he walks by and the chief master sergeant doesn't salute him. Mm -mm. You know, it's not optional. If you see any ranking officer, it doesn't matter how many stripes you got, you salute. The chief ignores him. And his mind ain't thinking, little kid, I ain't worried about him. I'm telling you, the lieutenant snapped. He got up in that chief face. He said, when you see this bar, you snap your behind to attention. Oh, the chief was so mad. He, but I don't care how mad you get, he outranks you. It's authority. <laughs> It's, it's authority. So you have to obey the command. When Jesus spoke to demons, it didn't matter how mad they got. Hey, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long you've been in there. It doesn't matter what you wanted to do and what you didn't want to do. It's authority. He said, come out and don't enter. You got no option but to come out and don't enter. If you disobey, you got the whole kingdom of God coming after you. Mm -hmm. If that chief would have told that lieutenant, I ain't slapping to no attention. I don't care what you think. That order disobeyed, you got the power of the Air Force behind that order. It's more than the 25-year-old boy you got to deal with. You got to deal with the law, the system that mm -hmm. governs that order that he gave. Knowledge brings confidence. Ignorance proceeds, uh, I'm sorry, produces guessing, trial and error. Lots of trial and error. You obey, uh, you don't obey law to get grace, but you get grace to obey law. There's been this consistent tension in Christianity between law and grace and law and grace. And it's all this tension. It's all this arguing and confusion. And when you really study this thing, it's really not that complex. It's really not that complex. It, it, you, you have two different covenants, two different systems, but it's still God's law. It's still God's word. 
The only thing that changes is the distribution of it. He said the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus. Let's not make it so complex. Listen to the words that articulate the law that came by Moses. It's still the law of God. It's still holy. It's still the law of truth. It's still the law of the Lord. But listen to a few other characteristics that is used to describe in the Bible. It's called the law of sin. Why does it call that? It points out sin. That's why you see a lot of don't do this. That's rebellion against God. Don't do this. That's rebellion against God. Don't do that. That's rebellion against God. So it points out sin and identifies it for you. It's called the law of sin and death. Why? Because the wages of sin is still death. Still death. So it points it out and it demands obedience to the law. It's mm -hmm. called the law of burnt offering. Why? Because there was sacrifice, there was a sacrificial system given, a burnt offering unto the Lord. It's called the law of carnal commandments. There was a lot of carnal things that man did. I mean, remember, carnal means be governed by the five senses. So there's a lot of carnal things that man did that there had to be requirements over. So when you guys do this, make sure you do it this way. And when you do that, make sure you do it this way. And you got to remember, it's, 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 it's an aggregate. So you have the Ten Commandments, all the additional 600 and something odd uh, ordinances are just an aggregate that goes into the Ten. It's, it's all, you can categorize, if you just wrote the Ten Commandments up there, all the other 600 and something odd commandments fit right into the categories. Mm -hmm. It was rules and, and, and requirements to help you keep the Ten. Because he's articulating a way of life. So when you go out, that's why it's called the law of carnal commandments. Is the carnal things that you do, they're still order associated with how you do them. Now listen to the way under the new covenant the laws are described. He said this is the law of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He calls it the law of faith. The law of liberty. The law of liberty. When the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So it's a law and a system and a governance that relies on the spirit of God. It's called the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. Jesus said, the words I speak, they are spirit and they mm -hmm. are life. Amen. It's still law. It's just proceeding out of the mouth of God. It says this is the law of Christ. Christ governs you now. You're slaves to Christ. He becomes master. He becomes dominion. He, he, he's the wisdom and power of God. It says, this is the law of thy mouth. If I could, if you ask me what was the one major differentiation between this system and this system, I would pick the law of thy mouth. The commandments don't speak. Talking about the laws of Moses, that's the, that's the one of the biggest difference because when he speaks out of his mouth, creates an empowerment. When he speaks out of his mouth, enables the word to become flesh. It is the reason why you can now have an embodiment of the word out of his mouth. When it's spoken to the heart of man, the effects of his word make sure that it's written in the heart of man. That's the transforming effect of it coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. What did Job say in Job 22, 22? He said, receive what? The law out of thy mouth. Yes. Out of his mouth. So it's a different, it, 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 it's still the law. Mm -hmm. It's 1127, so I'm, I'm going to do a part two to this, but we're going to go way further into the law and the governance and some of the differentiating factors um, because there's no way we're going to make it through it today. I'll just get through some of the other major points and then we'll do a round two next week. The blessing of a thing is in the instruction. The blessing of a thing is in the instruction. You gotta remember in Genesis, he said that he was going to bless them. And then he gave instruction right after saying he blesses them. The blessing is in the instructions. Hey, be fruitful, be fruitful, multiply. Subdue the earth, have dominion. The instruction is the empowerment to execute the instruction. 
The words he speaks are spirit and life. When he utters a word, it, it, it's, it's the rainbow word being spoken. Well, I thought rainbow was the utterance of the spirit. It is. God is spirit. God is spirit. When God speaks, that spirit speaking, so that's still the utterance of the spirit being spoken. It's just that it's dimensionally transferred now because he's in heaven, you're in the earth, place the Holy Spirit in you. When he speaks, the spirit hears and declares what the Lord has spoken. That's still the rhema word being spoken in the heart of man. That's still the commandment being written in the heart of man. Can you say that again? You said the instruction is the what? The empowerment? Yes, ma'am. The, the, the blessing is in the instruction because the instruction, when God instructs, he simultaneously empowers you with the ability to execute what he spoke. If God, if Jesus said, come to Peter, that's an instruction. He said, come. The, the moment he said, come, Peter just obtained the power to walk on water. Mm -hmm. He's only walking on water because he's, he's carrying out the instruction. If Jesus never says, come, Peter never walks on water. The, the, the blessing, the power was in the instruction. Come. Oh, that means I can come. Go. That means I can go. Every time God gives instruction, he just released the power to carry out the instruction. I can't wait for the day he tells me to give somebody a million dollars. Tell me to give him a million dollars, God, because that means you just released it to me. Amen. He has to. You can't tell me to do something without giving me the ability to do it. That, that's not how, that's not his nature. Please tell me to get, that. that's why he wants you to pray for other people. Pray for other people because through you, he'll bless them. He'll release it to you to give to them, but he always releases in abundance. He'll give you enough for them and still plenty enough for you. Amen. If you don't got it to give, Pray for them so he can give it through you. It's in the instruction. He said, "My this is Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. He said, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Listen carefully to my words. Do not lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your hearts. He said, it won't penetrate deep into your heart until you give attention to them and listen to them. Meditate on them. It'll penetrate into your heart. Now look at what the word does when it penetrates into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. He said when you meditate on them, they penetrate your heart. They bring forth life. They bring forth life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Healing to their whole body. I told you this thing is all about laws. If, 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 if somebody's that needed healing, the word has to go forth. It has to go forth. It has to penetrate the heart. He said once it get in there, it, it, it will provide healing to the whole body. John, uh, you know what? I'm going to come back to that scripture. We only got 10 more minutes. All right, this is where I want to go. In every manual of a product, there are two major pages. And I, and I really, really, really want you to understand this. There's two major pages. One is a page of caution. If you don't believe it, go pick up any product in your house, your television, your laptop, your remote control, your stereo, whatever it is. Find the manual and look in it, and you're going to see two big pages. This is where the most of the content is. One page is the page of caution. It's warnings. 
cautions and warnings. The other page is instructions, operating instructions. Caution says, do not do this. Do not do that. Do not do this. Why? It's trying to show you how not to operate the product because it provides, it creates damage. It's risk in it. So don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't, don't commit fornication. Don't steal. Don't, don't bear false witness. Don't murder. Don't covet. Don't, don't, don't. These are cautions. Mm -hmm. Don't use the product that way. That's not the way the product is meant to be used. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't do that with that. It's cautions. Every manual have a do not risk. It's it, it's it's necessary because humans have a tendency to mess everything up. <laughs> they just love to experiment. They one you don't read the manual no way, so you just be experimenting. <laughs> and when the when the product gets damaged or the product causes damage because of your misuse of the product. Now you've got a problem with the manufacturer. And he said, hey, if you would have looked in the manual, I told you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. I told you not to kill. I told you not to steal. I told you not to, 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 to lie. I told you not to cheat. I told you not to commit fornication. I, I, I listed these things. These were my cautions. Stay away from that stuff. If you purchase mm -hmm. an iron, an iron that you iron your clothes with, it's going to have a caution page. It's going to tell you uh, when you plug in the iron, make sure your hands aren't wet. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, it's your iron. It's your iron. You paid your money for it. If you want to put your hands in the dishwater and then plug the iron in, it's your business. <laughs> if you want to get in the bathtub, and, and I don't know why you do it, but you want to iron your clothes like you're in the bathtub, like, it's crazy to me, but it, you have that. It's your business. <laughs> But the manual will say that you can shock yourself. Electricity is going through that thing. It says that you can create significant bodily harm if you do that. But you're allowed to do it. You're, you're free will, right? Yeah, you can, you can do it. You can commit mm -hmm. fornication. Is, is your life? Yes, you can. You can commit murder. Mm -hmm. There's risks associated with it. There's, there's risks associated with it. Amen. He said, don't do these things because they're harmful to you. On the other page, you have operating instructions. It says, do this with this product. This is what this button does. This is what this operation does. This is what this process does. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Much like this system that we have right here, isn't it? We have a lot of don't do's, and then we have a lot of do's. The do's do not cancel out the don't do's. I come not to abolish the law. Mm -hmm. I ain't getting rid of the cautions. I, I, I'm not saying don't be cautions. I'm not saying that these things can cause harm. I'm not, I'm not taking those away. I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. What does that mean? I came to show you how to operate so that these things don't happen. I came to show you how to properly operate the body Amen. to avoid the things that, 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 that Moses and the prophets cautioned you on. Mm -hmm. I came to fulfill it. I Amen. came to be Amen. the example. Hey, you dry your hands first, son, then you plug in the iron. That's so what she taught your children. Your children were children. Were his children. He said, I came to show you how to do it. Don't do it that way, son. Do it this way. Hey, before you pick that up, put, put, put this here. And, and, and I'm sure I am the example. Amen. Amen. I'm showing you how to do it. Let me be the pattern. Now, now here's something beautiful. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, I only do. I'm going to write this word up here because it's, it's beyond critical. This word only. It's very straightforward. There's no misconception on what this word means. It's literal. It's not metaphoric. 
I only do what the Father shows me. I mm -hmm. only say what the Spirit tells me to say. I, mm -hmm. I do nothing, nothing. And there's mm -hmm. nothing that I do that's of my own will. If I, if I go here, it's because I was sick there. If I yeah. say this, it's because it's what I heard. I don't do anything that I'm not instructed to do. Mm -hmm. I am not my own. I do what's pleasing unto the Father. He says, go and I go. He says, come and I come. He says, speak and I speak. He says, sleep and I sleep. He says, pray and I pray. Whatever he says, I do. Nothing else. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they shall be called the children of God. If you only do what the Spirit says, if you're only led by the Spirit, you do not need the do nots. The do nots don't go away. They don't go away. They're not abolished. But you don't need to be paying so close attention to the do nots if you only do the do's. <laughs> if, if you focus and your whole life is guided by the Spirit, which not many of us can say that. But when Jesus said, I only do this and I only do that, which is all Spirit-led, he said, the Spirit takes into account. He knows the laws. He knows the caution. He will never lead me in the way of sin. He'll never lead me into the way of sin. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if he guides my life, now I'm living the law of the spirit of life. I'm living the law from his mouth. He leads me and he guides me and what I should do and what I should not do. It's the conviction of the spirit. We don't have to fight about the difference between the law uh, that came by Moses and grace and truth in Jesus. Jesus said it upholds the law. Mm -hmm. He shows you how to keep it. It's the law of righteousness. The only, the only challenge is, I told you that is Christ's righteousness. He said, if there was a law written that could bring forth life, the spirit gives life. The spirit gives life. If there was a law in the laws of Moses that could give forth life, then righteousness would have been by the law. Mm -hmm. Righteousness would have came by the law. But you're, it, it requires the law of the spirit of life to renew man, to renew man, to be righteous with God. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm going to shift your direction. I gave you the laws of Moses so that you can understand sin, so that you can see, so that there could be transgression. But now that grace and truth has come, he said, you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Now he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct your path. He's going to show you what to do. He's going to show you what to, to not do. He said, it's no longer your schoolmaster. That's now the job of the spirit. It's now the job of the spirit. Uh, that's John 6, 6, 3 that says the spirit is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak are spirit and they are life. Um, Psalms 32 and 8, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. This is the commitment of God. I'm going to guide you along the best pathway of your life. I, 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 listen to the accountability. I will advise you. I will advise you. I'm your advisor. I instruct. I direct. I lead. I guide. This is why the law was the schoolmaster. You didn't have the way of the spirit. The New Testament says, until the way of faith had come, you were shut up unto the law. There was no guide. There was no mm -hmm. guidance of the spirit. There was no instruction from the inside out. So you mm -hmm. needed a schoolmaster. Yes. Fine, great. The schoolmaster gave laws. But listen to this scripture here. And this is an important one. 
can skip down a little bit. Come on, where are you at? There we go. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. I'm going to read it from the Amplified because it gives a better articulation. It says, he has qualified us, making us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ. It says, not of the letter of a written code, but of the spirit. We know the scripture says, for the letter killeth, talking about the law, but the spirit giveth life. It says, the letter killeth by revealing sin and demanding obedience. That's what the law did. It revealed sin. Look at your sinful ways. And it demands obedience to the law. God will always demand obedience. I don't care what covenant you're under. It reveals sin, and now it demands obedience. That's why the scripture says sin is the transgression of the law. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. God wanted you to be aware of the sinfulness of sin. Demanding obedience, but spirit gives life. Look, look at what it says here in Leviticus. This is Leviticus 5.17. It says, suppose you sin by violating one of the Lord's commands. Even if you are unaware of what you have done, you are guilty and will be punished for your sin. I don't care if you're aware of it or not. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, it's, it's, if, 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 if I do something illegal while driving a car and I hit another car, I can't tell the judge I was I, I was unaware. You don't care. You still held accountable. You don't get a pass because you said I was unaware that that was the case. No, you still get a fine. I was unaware that that the speed limit was 65. I was going 80. I was unaware of 65. Fine, you're unaware, but here's your ticket. He said, even if you're unaware of what you have done, you are guilty and will be punished for your sin. My God, that's a lot of laws to memorize, man. There's going to be some things that I'm unaware of. But, 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 but. To him that knoweth to do good and do it to not, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. And under this new covenant where the, the spirit wants to guide you and, and, and take accountability for what you do and what you don't do and take accountability for the, for the corrections. He wants to give you the warnings and the instruction. Cooperating the body being the guide, telling you where you go, telling you what you should be, telling you what to say. And Jesus said, I've come to show you how to live according to this new system of grace. The law is still holy. The law is still righteous. It just don't have the capacity to make you righteous. Righteousness is a faith. The scripture says, plain as day, the law is not a faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the reign of word of God. That's not the law of Moses. I told you the instructions create the empowerment within. The law can't do that. So it becomes the law of, 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 of condemnation is referred to. The law of condemnation, the law of sin and death. Because it's pointing out those things and demanding obedience. The spirit says, I give you grace to keep the law. This isn't the license to sin. Hey, we're under grace. We don't got to pay attention to the law. We can live how we want it to. No, that, 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 that's not the message. The message is it gives you grace to keep the law. So you're doing something that, that, that's against God's will, and then the spirit wants the opportunity to convict. It wants the opportunity to correct. It says every sin is not unto death. It's not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. If you make one little wrong step, God will say, hey, he made a misstep. Cut him off. Shut him down. Every sin is unto spiritual separation. Why? Because he gives us grace as children. He gives us an opportunity for correction. Under this system, good luck, Charlie. <laughs> He said, under this system, you break one, you've broken them all. That's why when the high priest was stepping to the holies of holies, one misstep in his life was taken from him instantly. This system demands perfection. 
Now, yes, they had the sacrificial system and the burnt offerings, and, 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 and God gave them opportunities through that system, but it demands perfection. Now, don't get it wrong. He still demands perfection here. He said, be ye therefore holy as your Father in heaven is holy, but he also commands you to be perfect. And the spirits of just men are made perfect. And so he wants you to live a life after the law of faith. He said, those who live righteously, a righteous man lives by faith. That's by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. I'm going to instruct where you go. I'm going to instruct what you do. I'm going to instruct what you say. So the disciples, don't worry about what you say. You just show up to where I'm telling you to go. And when you get there, I'll tell you what to say. Obedience is about staying under what is heard. He's speaking, you're listening. That's the hearing of faith. Stay under what is heard. Um, Romans 3.21 says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I'll tell you one thing that's significant. The disciples asked Jesus, what's the most important law? What's the, what's the heaviest? What's the most significant? And God said, Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It was the law of love. And he said, and then there's a second one that's just like the first one that talks about loving your neighbor. But you won't be able to love your neighbor appropriately unless you first love God appropriately. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able to love God appropriately unless you understand that he first loved you appropriately. So he said, once, once you learn how to love me and operate with the law of love, that will enable you to learn how to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And then now listen to how he wraps up this scripture. He said, you can take all of the law, all 613. He said, you can take all of the law and all of the prophets and hang them on these two laws. Mm -hmm. It's an aggregate. He said, the reason why I gave you all of these laws under Moses was to help you fulfill these two. To help you fulfill these two. And you are going to come to learn that without the guidance of the spirit, without the law from his mouth, without the law of the spirit of life, you will never be able to operate in the law to fulfill those two. The law was meant to bring man to his end, to realize that you can't do it without Christ. He brought you to your end. At some point, I just can't keep these things. And now Jesus coming up here talking <laughs> about some, even if you obey the commandment, even if you thought about it, you still, like, I can't keep this thing. I can't do it. You, you, now, Jesus, you're just making it impossible. Now, that, that, that goes against the laws of Moses. The law of Moses said, do not commit fornication. Now, I ain't mess with that moment. But you're going to tell me because I, I, I looked upon her and I thought about it and I desired it that I'm still found guilty. Well, that means for me to, to, to keep that law, I'm going to have to be transformed from within because I can't always control my thought life. He said, exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, God, I, I don't want to lust after women and I don't want to look upon the fornication. You're going to have to change my way of thinking. He said, exactly. And he said, the law of Moses is not going to be able to transform the thinking, but the law of the Spirit can. Mm -hmm. The law of the Spirit can. So now you can look, look at the transformation through the law of the Spirit. You can keep the laws of Moses, do not commit fornication, and you can be made righteous in your thinking. Don't look upon that woman in lust and, and, and have committed it in your heart, which is iniquity. It kept both of them. The law of the spirit keeps both. It's, we won't have to fight and tussle between Moses and grace and Moses and grace. We won't have to do that because the spirit will never violate the laws of Moses. Came out the same mouth of God. So they both the law of God. 
He said, I'm just empowering you that the, the law of the spirit allows you to embody the character of the Ten Commandments. That's why it says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Jesus put the spirit of the law back into it. You got to remember, repent, renew, restore, reconcile, receive, re, re, re. Why? I'm bringing you back to the garden. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing you back to the garden. In the garden, God did nothing more than instruct. Hey, Adam, you can do this and you can eat that and you can do this and you can name these animals and you can do. That's operating instructions. And then here comes the caution. Don't touch that tree. That's a commandment. But he wanted to raise his kids himself through his instruction, through his correction. He know how to chastise. He know when to chastise. He knows when to instruct. He knows when to give sympathy. He knows when to give empathy. He knows when to bring wrath. He knows what's best for his children. He placed you under this law so that you could see the need to be brought back to Christ. And when the way of faith came through Christ, the law hands you right over and said, there you go. Now make them perfect in Christ so that they can keep the law. So that they can keep the law. 11.55. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Pick it up again next week. Uh, let me make sure there wasn't one last, one last point I wanted to make. I think that's a good spot. Good spot to stop. Um, yeah, last scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Because I was just talking about the garden and him bringing us back to that. And 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He said there's a simplicity that's in Christ where your life is instructed, you're given the operating instructions, and the Spirit cautions you on what not to do, he said, this is a very simplistic way of operating in Christ, and Satan wanted to get them out of that system. But that is the original system that God wanted you in, where the cautions and the instructions were found through Christ. Stop there uh, for any questions, any comments, and then we'll pick it up again next week and go through it a bit more. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you for the lesson. That was a good teaching on the kingdom. And I just want to say that um, in the Old Testament, there was a law that said that uh, hus brothers had to marry their wives if one died. Mm -hmm. so, in, so in one of the stories, uh, this man didn't really want to and he was supposed to go in to be with his brother's wife. Mm -hmm. And he went in, but he refused to do what was needed to be done with her. And so mm -hmm. she fell dead right there on the spot. That's right. So, I mean, if we were still living under that law, <laughs> a lot of people might act a little bit different. <laughs> But God gave us grace and his love, and he wanted to show us a lot more mercy, give us chance after chance, praise God. And I just hope that many of us would take advantage of what Jesus did for us and, and be grateful. You have to come to know him to know and to be grateful. Other than that, you just think it's just something that we're just doing. But I do, I do pray that people would get a close encounter with the Lord and understand his great and wonderful, beautiful benefits that he has given us. Thank you for the lesson. Praise God. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. I, there's a lot that you said today that I still have to kind of mull over and think about, but um, to just make sure I articulate what I took away in a, in a, in a clear way. But a couple of things that just stood out to me, um, and you said it very well, you said at the beginning is that slavery isn't an option. You just choose your master. Mm -hmm. And um, slavery, just that word slavery just seems so extreme. There's so many things that the word of God says that I think we gloss over or pass over because it feels or seems extreme, but yet uh, we basically comply by those rules and those systems on a daily basis. If you live a life that is the majority of your life disconnected from the voice of the Lord or from his leading and the majority of your life is spent not in devotion or in close proximity to him, you are under the rule of something else. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, decisions, habits, everything else is still under the rule of something else. And so we often think about slavery being extreme, but there was always something trying to control us. There's always something trying to um, exert its influence over us. And that's why a lot of people talk about the battle is for your mind. Um, but it's it's really the battle for what you're who you're going to listen to and who you're going to follow. And so I just wanted to underscore that that every single thing we do, every single thought we have, everything, every single decision we make is under, is the result of some kind of influence. And when we talk about the righteous man, the man is righteous because he lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's, it's really enlightening the fact that the only way that we are righteous is if we can hear. And the only way that we can hear is if we are in a position to hear from him. Because if we're not hearing from him, we're hearing from somebody else. Mm -hmm. um and the other thing I wanted to just talk about is that so the same thing around about about being righteous um the law which is the law of the spirit um as we understand it in the new covenant gives you the knowledge to control circumstances that was a a major point for me we all want to control our circumstance we all want to control and have the ability to change things that we think are not good, are not right, are not beneficial um, in our lives. That's the internal struggle we have every day, that things happen to us or happen around us that we don't agree with or we don't like. The law of the spirit of life gives us that blessing, that empowerment, that word that's released gives us the empowerment to change the world around us. And when you talk about kingdom being about dominion, that's what it is. It's about being in a position for you to release the power that has been deposited in you to change the circumstances around you. We're just doing it for the kingdom of God instead of for the kingdom of darkness. Amen. And so the law not being abolished, but Jesus coming to fulfill the law allows us to have that power at our disposal through Christ living on the inside of us. So I really appreciate those two comments. There's many more, but I got to spend some time reading and studying to kind of piece them all <laughs> together. So I appreciate it. And can uh, I say, can I say one thing after what Leisha just said? Um, yeah. This, this uh, slavery. Just think if if we had a, this is a spiritual choice that we're making about slavery, but just think in the natural, if our ancestors had had an opportunity to choose their own master who they wanted to be under, at least Jesus gives us a choice. <laughs> God is giving us a choice. They didn't get a choice. They, bought, they were bought, paid for, and you became their slave. Now we get an opportunity to decide who we want our master to be. Yeah, and I That's think, right. and I think to your point, like I, I, I sound like a broken record in my mind, and sometimes I feel like I'm a broken record in these. When we come together, there is always a natural example of of the kingdom. Slavery mm -hmm. is a great one because when we were enslaved, we 
were indoctrinated into the cultures of the masters that we that we were under. Yes. We were we acted a certain way, spoke a certain way, did mm-hmm. certain things, didn't do other things because the master dictated the culture. Amen. He dictated how we lived our lives. Mm-hmm. And we had laws to live by. Mm-hmm. Same with the kingdom. But our minds want to say in this modern world, like that just sounds too extreme. <laughs> but we're slaves to something. Amen. Amen. It's just what we choose to become slaves to. Mm-hmm. Amen. And, and going off of what you just said, Risha, about the um, being indoctrinated, that, that's uh, a big issue when it comes to some people, um, their train of thought about Christianity and and the black man or you know black people that they want to say well that's the white man's religion you know because of how it was taught or how it was brought i should say to slaves you know un- unfortunately that they were given the version that they wanted them to know about at that time mm-hmm. um, so yeah that's a, a big deal you know that we have to rightly divide and and understand it on our own for you know the the word as it was meant to be presented. That's right. Amen. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's why I keep saying that, that statement that um, freedom and independence are not synonymous. That true freedom comes on the back of complete dependence. You know, a, a slave depends entirely on his master entirely for its food, for its sleep, for its well-being, for its clothes, for its shelter, entirely. And so Christ says, I want you to depend entirely on me. Mm-hmm. And he said he, 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 he does it in grace through love. He gives it freely in grace, but it comes to the distribution of love. And so when, when one comes to understand what the dependence of Christ provides. The scripture said that when a man found the kingdom, he went and sold everything he had. Mm-hmm. Because of what he has, what, what he now has become slave to. Yeah. Because when you're in a kingdom, you're owned by the king, literally owned by the king. You can do whatever you want with you. And so this king, he said, when you understand my kingdom, and you willfully come. I don't make anybody come into the kingdom. When you willfully come, of your own volition, you give up everything else you had to be slaves to this kingdom. Because the level of freedom that comes with the dependence on the king is unmatched. There is no parallel that can compare. All your needs are met. All the laboring and toiling is over. And he said, come to me and I I, I give rest. I fill you with joy and peace and believing. I supply all your needs. I provide prosperity. I give purpose. I give direction. I give love. So I I can't get that anywhere else. I'm happy to be fully dependent upon the king. Independence is the biggest threat to the king, to any kingdom. It's independence. Mm-hmm. We, we've come to look at independence and freedom because we're in a system of democracy. But he said in the, in the, in the system outside of this world, the system of the kingdom, you won't no longer love independence, but you'll come to love dependence. Mm-hmm. That's different systems. Amen. Any other thoughts or questions? Awesome. I'll close this out with a word of prayer and we'll get back to it again next week. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to discuss your word, an opportunity to discuss your law, an opportunity to understand uh, your systems of governance, understanding of your kingdom and your righteousness, um, understanding of the, the laws that came by Moses and grace and truth that came by Jesus, for they were both necessary. And Father, we thank you for those laws of Moses that acted as our schoolmaster. We, we, we thank you 
where they, they had a necessity. There was meaning and purpose behind it. And we thank you for the laws that govern the spirit of life because it's, it's, it's necessary and it's essential to our life. And we thank you for the grace that came by Jesus that, that gives us opportunity to, to come back into right standing and to, to be made whole and to be made righteous and to stand before your throne of grace. Yes. We thank you for the opportunity to, to learn and practice the laws of faith that appropriates the things that Jesus died on Calvary to appropriate on our behalf. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, for we understand that it's not our righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Christ that we're now clothed with. Mm -hmm. That gives us a chance to be children of God again. We make commitments to be led by the Spirit of God, so we meet the requisite of being children of God. Yes. Yes. We make commitments to, to be led and to be guided. We make commitments to, to pray for others so that through us you can bless them as you did with Abraham, Father. We thank you for your law. We thank you for your precepts. As David said, we will meditate on your precepts. For your laws are better than life itself. Mm -hmm. Speak to us. Because through the hearing of faith, Lord, we know we shall be transformed through the renewing of our hearts and the renewing of our minds. And the end goal is to be more like you. We won't just talk about your goodness. We won't just talk about your love, but we will be the hands and feet of Jesus. We will show the people the love of God more than we'll yes. let them hear about it. Yes. We thank you and we forever give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we thank you all and love you and we'll be back again next Sunday to hit round two of it. Okay, hey, love you too. Okay, love thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Yeah.